chapter 1, and we're going from verse 18 all the way to chapter 2, verse 5. And we're talking about the wisdom of God and the foolishness of man. Alright. Looks like I get a big podium, but I'm the kind of guy I always stuff it with lots of stuff. <laughs> Alright. So if you if you got your Bibles open, as you turn in there, we're going to talk today about uh, about a lot of things. I put a bunch of things up here, okay? But basically, it's about comparing the wisdom of man with the wisdom of God. Two totally bipolar opposites, all right? No matter how smart you can be, a PhD, ten different types of PhD. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you still know nothing in the big picture of the scene of things. It's not going to affect your your eternity whatsoever without believing in Jesus Christ. And I wrote on here, they had trusted in Jesus for salvation and then wanted to add human wisdom. Because as we started Corinthians, they called them a bunch of saints, they called them believers, they called them brothers in Christ. And yet this is the church that was made full of people who were all kinds of desperately uh, wicked type of folks. Like, like if we would maybe uh, look at, I don't know, a drug addict or some kind of way you look at somebody in society, it's like, wow, that is a really hopeless person. You know, maybe a drug addict homeless guy or something. That's the way the Corinthians were looked at. They were looked at as the deplorable people, as the people that had all kinds of trouble all over them. That's the way they looked at the Corinthians, all right? And yet the Corinthians were a church of God. They were saints. They were saved. But then what happened after they got saved with that base belief in Jesus Christ that he died for them on the cross, some other people, they come in and try to add some wisdom. 
Now we got to remember the Corinthian church is a Gentile church. So we're going to talk about the Jews a little bit today. But the Jews all wanted a sign. The Corinthians, the Greeks, they all wanted to know something more. They wanted philosophy. They wanted like man's wisdom. And that's what was happening. They were trying to add man's wisdom to the church. And that just doesn't mix like that. Okay, We can't add man's wisdom to the church and think it will make us more. We've got to stay focused on God's wisdom. And men are still trying to figure out what life is all about today. Now, even though this was written a long time ago, it's still the same way today. It's written back in the first century. Men are still trying to figure out what life is all about. We still have all kinds of new science or new philosophy or new ideas and new people to listen to, and a lot of them aren't pointing toward God. Modern man has made gods of the human education and opinion. Many Christians look elsewhere rather than to God's Word. It really is like that. How many places, how many churches today are more focused on numbers and how they're going to bring everybody in and they're going to talk about the things that everybody wants to hear about than about the Bible, than about Jesus Christ, than about the message that we are sinners and that God's wrath is abiding upon us and if we don't believe, we can't be saved, all right? How many shift away from that base message and go to some other entirely different message and people leave and they're wooed and they're odd, but if you ask them what they learned, it doesn't come back to the Bible. And usually a lot of times they don't even know what they learned. They just know it felt pretty good. They're like, yeah, yeah, it felt good. I can remember myself as a young man in uh, college. I took my bachelor's degree while I was in the Army from Campbell University. And I had to take a couple Christian classes. And I remember they started teaching me about Jed P. And I don't know if you guys know what Jed P is, but that's the, that's the uh, modern theologian's way to try to say that Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible, and the Bible was all edited and fixed up and added and things as time went on, and it's a, it's a lot, but the way these guys present it from the high scholarly people and all the PhDs, even the ones with the Bible PhDs, some of them, I as a young guy thought, wow, this is something really interesting, this is something really there, until I found out later, this is just a bunch of man made up fake wisdom trying to discredit the Bible. Really, every bit of man wisdom you find out there discredits the Bible. It goes against God. It doesn't support God. It goes against God. We don't go out there and search these things from, a, from the, from the non-Christian perspective and see that they're saying, oh yeah, that means the Bible's true, this and that. They're just trying their best to disprove the Bible, to discredit the Bible, to discredit God. And it really comes down to that... Uh, to God or Satan. You know, what does Satan want to do? He doesn't want to draw you to God. He wants you to hate God. He wants you to, to, to go in the path that he's going. And he's never going to try to get his people to encourage you to follow after God. So we can't think that in the pursuit of wisdom from a worldly perspective, we're going to find God. And that's what this passage is going to hit on pretty good. And it's no different than in the garden. Remember in the garden of Eden when Satan showed up? He told Eve, he said, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. She desired wisdom too. She desired to be like God, to know like God, to be in that kind of an area. And that was the, the first man and woman that ever dwelt on the earth. And it happened all the way back in the garden. So, so it's no different today than it was then. It's still the same way today. All right. I got a nice prop right here. Man, am I proud of this prop right here. I know Bill knows what it is. <laughs> it's not to hit anybody with, okay? But this is what they called a cubit, all right? And a cubit was how they measured things back in the days of Noah. So if you read in your Bible that the ark was, uh, you know, 300 cubits, 300 of these things added together right there. Makes around 450 feet long. But, but that... But that goes, it goes all the way back. We really are no different than we were all the way back then. There's still a lot of stuff. If you look, I, I got to go on that trip. There was so much wisdom put together to be able to make a boat that would survive a year's worth of flooding that the entire earth was flooded. I mean, just tremendously. It would be, it was just shocking. I was like, wow, I never would have thought about that. I never would have thought about this. And this is man 4,000 years ago. And he was just as smart as we are today, okay? We may have different education, 
We may know different things, but we are still human beings. And the human beings then were just like we are now. They thought the same way. They, they uh, were just as intelligent as we were. Just because they didn't have iPhones or computers or these other things didn't mean they were any different than we are. Morally, we are just as corrupt and messed up as they were back then as well with morals, okay? Because we constantly have that draw of sin that tries to drag us away from God. And that's, unfortunately, if a person doesn't start off with the base, base thing of believing in the message of the cross and Jesus Christ coming and die for us, the rest of everything they've got their foundation built on is going to be messed up. It's going to be like, uh, you ever been to Orlando, they have an upside down house like Ripley's Believe It or Not or something? That's what it's going to be like. You're going to build a magnificent structure that's really worthless in the end. All right, And that's what happens if we work on the wisdom of man. Philosophy is not the judge. Okay, so many people today they think, well, philosophically thinking it should be like this or like that. Philos philosophers all disagree and they're always fighting each other, and it's just a whole bunch of craziness going on. They are not the judge. All right, scripture alone is enough. We don't need philosophy. We don't need all these other things. What we need is what the Word of God says. Amen. Psychology is not the answer. Okay, that's also not the answer. You may be messed up in the head and think, well, I just need the psychologist. Well, the psychologist may help you with a lot of things, but they're not going to help you with the most important thing in life of knowing Jesus Christ. Psychology will lead you to, to recognize that you've got some guilt and shame in your life or things that hold you back, but it won't give you any answer that works. It'll give you some kind of a like a, a covering. It'll be like a, trying to put something on your on your food to mask the taste, all right? I, I've been working at some Alzheimer's folks this week, and I learned with Alzheimer's that one of the last bits of taste that goes as we start to lose our minds, if it happens to you, is the sense of taste, that everything will taste sour. So the older folks with Alzheimer's will put sugar on everything they've got, not because they have such a sweet tooth, but because it's such a terrible taste all the time. They're just trying to mask that sour taste. Really, that's the same way psychology is. If you just follow non-Christian psychology to fix yourself, it's not really going to change anything in the end. Okay, It's just going to mask things. It can only identify feelings, but never give the answer of sin and forgiveness. The only way we're ever going to be forgiven of our sin is through Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no other way. No other way we're ever going to find forgiveness of sin. All of man's problems are the result of sin. And let that sit with you a little bit. Every single problem we have is the result of sin. Every problem. I mean, you may think, well, it's just something that go right. Why did things not go right? Because in the garden, when man sinned, God cursed everything. He cursed the animals. He cursed the creation. He cursed the ground. Everything was cursed in the garden. So what caused the curse from God in the garden? Sin. Every single problem we can think about is the result of sin. Maybe you may say, well, it seems to be my problem, but then I found out it really wasn't a problem. I was the problem. Well, how did that happen? There's a sin. It got you blinded, got you messed up, and you needed to grow, all right? Every problem is the result of sin. And man's wisdom always elevates himself and always lowers God. Every time. It'll elevate himself like I know all these things, and it'll lower God. Like, yeah, but and that's what that says. But let me tell you all the things that I know. Yeah. And, it, and that's the way things go. So that's the big thrust. I know there was a lot I gave you. But we're going to get started here. And I have a few verses before we actually get started in the Corinthians that, that line up and really help support this message. In Colossians 2.8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. I tell you, this verse applies so much today, if I had money for a billboard, I'd probably put it up on the highway or something. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, look at this. It says, it says, be careful not to be taken captive from philosophy and empty deception. And all it does is lead you away from God. All right, every bit of stuff today in the world is going away from God. They're not going toward God. All right, because right. what did I say? The devil—he's not a divided kingdom. He's not going to say, "Oh, you know what? 
You guys, I don't know if I want you. You go over toward God. He wants to see destruction to every single one of us. Every bit of sin wants to draw us away from God. And as it says, don't be captive. Don't be a prisoner from the vain philosophy and the empty deception and be bought into all these lies. And it says, according to what? The tradition of men. And tradition means something that's been going on a long time. This was written a long time ago, but it's still the tradition of men today. Empty philosophy, empty deception, just trying to fool you. You know, check these things, look at it. I love it. I tell you, did I like that? The Ark experience and stuff, because it pointed out, it pointed out that we have the exact same evidence that we found from back then with everything that's been found. And yet we have completely different theories, completely different understandings. And I tell you what, if you go to the Ark of Creation Museum, you will most likely come out a young earth believer, a person believing in the Word of God, believing in what God's Word says is true and what man says is a lie. All right? You really will, because you'll see how all these things fit together so well and how everything that we've been told, taught, growing up with, that it's not like, oh, I just kind of consider this little Christian thought here. It will it'll floor you and it'll make you realize all of this other stuff is a lie, it's fake, and it's brought up and taught as facts in our schools, in our society, and it's not real, all right? There's all kinds of messed up stuff out here, and you'll see it. But uh, that's it's just elementary principles, okay? It's what they're trying to go by instead of a going according to Christ. And I, I love Romans. I've got a few verses of Romans in here, and if you want a great Bible study, as Lou tried to say, come out on Thursday night, because we started in the book of Romans, and we're going to see all kinds of truths of God, of doctrine expressed, of all kinds of things for us to learn. And we only went to verse 17, so if you come out this week, you'll be hitting this verse as well, too. But it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So who suppresses the truth? Man suppresses the truth. We hold back the truth, all right? Even in our schools, you know, when they're teaching them that they came from a monkey, that you came from some kind of garbage that happened to become a man, that is the greatest fantasy world you could ever live in. What have we ever seen that grew up? Could you imagine? If I didn't clean the church, which I don't do that great of a job cleaning church, but imagine if I took a long time. There may be a corner in this church I've never cleaned the whole few years we've been here. Imagine all of a sudden we see a little man starting to form. We see some creature start to grow from dust. It would be amazing. It would be a wild type of thing. But that's never happened. It never will happen. Maybe we can find some mold or some kind of plant life growing, right? Or fungus. But we're not going to see a living being, an animal, anything go from nothing. It's never going to happen. And yet that's taught to be accepted as this is just the way that it is. And it's man suppressing the truth. And if people say enough things to you enough times, you'll start to believe it. And I tell you what, every one of us has been tainted by this culture, by this world, and we start to believe things that are against the Word of God. Amen. It says the next verse, going through 118 to 20 of Romans, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So who makes sure we see everything? God does. God knows our condition. He knows our fallenness. He knows that we're all messed up with all kinds of sin surrounding us all over the place, and yet He loves us so much, He shows us His evidence. And the evidence this is talking about is creation itself is when you look at you and I, when you look at the trees and the sky and the earth and the stars and the, and the galaxy and, and beyond, you know, and you can see the creation of God is tremendous, so tremendous. And we don't need a sign. We don't have to have another special sign. All right, I've got some verses about signs, but the Jews wanted signs. They were as people, they were like, that's a sign. I need a sign. Well, let me tell you, we got it right in the Word of God. We don't need any more signs. Jesus did so many signs, and so did the apostles. We don't need those anymore. We got it in the Word, all right? This last part of Romans. It says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. There's no excuse. Not one person in the entire world 
has an excuse why they don't know Jesus Christ. Not mm -hmm. one. All right? The Bible's clear on this. One of my favorite things I keep talking about, because I went there, I promise I won't talk about it every week, but when I was there too, there's a pillar in the Creation Museum that's got a giant Bible verse on it. It's this one right here. And it says, and they are without excuse. Loud and clear, huge giant pillar, like a, like a Corinthian type pillar, like the one in my picture here. Big giant pillar says, we are without excuse. God didn't say, well, you know, they're going to be okay. Or, you know, they were a good person. No, you either know Jesus Christ and submit to him, or you are doomed. I mean, it's a horrible fate that's coming for all those who don't know Jesus Christ. Amen. And it says here, too, notice the wording. It says, in the middle here, it says, these things have been clearly seen. It's not like God's hit these things away that, you know, you may stumble upon it in life, read some book in a chapter of a book or a page, and think, wow, and then forget about it as you go to the next page and then never be able to find it again. <laughs> it says here, it's clearly seen. Every single day we wake up, we draw a breath. That's a sign from God. That's a miracle that we're alive, that we're breathing, that we see all these things. It's clearly seen. There, and I also wrote here, men are not merely ignorant, but scornful of the truth. Not only are they ignorant, not wanting to see it or realize it or believe in it, they want to make fun of it. They want to put it down. Even back then, I didn't cite the passage with this, but there was a guy back then, and I even forget his name, but he hated Christians in the first century, and he wrote terrible things about this passage we're preaching right here, making fun of the Christians, citing the Word of God, and then twisting it and putting them down. And that's really how, how people are. And that was a guy probably lived close enough to time that his grandpa or somebody actually knew that Jesus rose from the dead, actually saw dead men rise, actually saw the, the sky go dark when Jesus died, and yet they mock God. And some questions that are going to be answered in this passage is, should Christians seek to possess wisdom? And the answer is yes, but only if it's cross-centered, all right? Does that mean you shouldn't go to be a doctor or be an be a engineer? No, that's good stuff right there. But if it doesn't start with Jesus Christ at the cross, it's really just a waste of time if you put the whole life together because it misses everything. All right? If it starts with Jesus Christ at the cross, sure, do all those things. It helps mankind out. It does some good for a little bit of time right here. You know, it profits a little bit for a little bit of time. But we're all going to pass on and die. None of us are exempt from death. Do Christians with godly wisdom merit any special status? The answer is no. We don't get special status, all right? It says, but they will receive greater praise on Judgment Day. So we're going to see that in these verses we're going to look at today. So we'll get greater praise on Judgment Day, but we don't get to have special status. You know, Christians are suffering today just as much as the rest of the world is suffering. I guarantee in Florida today, I know some of them. I got some Christian brothers in Florida. I lived there a few years, and they're suffering just as much as the non-godly people there are suffering. Everybody's suffering there. We don't get special treatment necessarily on this side of heaven. Can we recognize true wisdom through our speech? Yes, if it points people to the cross. No, if it revels in its own rhetoric. So you go on and on, but you're missing Jesus Christ? That's not really true wisdom. Okay, that, That's just stuff. And that stuff is really going to end up being garbage in the end. The message of the cross is offensive, and it should never be diluted. And as I said, some churches, they try to take the, all the offensiveness away so everybody will feel good and nobody will be upset, no feelings will be hurt. And really, they dilute the Bible, and then no longer is it the message of the cross. The cross is an ugly message. All right, The cross says that you are such a desperately wicked sinner doomed to hell with no hope whatsoever on your own, that Jesus, God Almighty, had to come down and be hung on the cross and crucified and murdered that for us so that we could be forgiven and go to heaven. That's a hard message right there. Okay, There's a lot of churches that aren't preaching that hard message. Or the part they do is they leave out the part that you're a sinner, wicked, and in desperate need of the cross, and they just say, Jesus loves you so much he died for you. And it's become such a such just a, a said thing that nobody really grasps the depth of that. To grasp the depth of that, you're also grasping that you are a wicked sinner, hopeless on your own, and in desperate need of him, with no other chance beside him. It should cause us awe. Every time we hear that Jesus loves me so much he died for me, we should be like, oh, 
Wow, thank you, Jesus, and all and praise. It just makes us want to give him glory and worship him. It shouldn't be something that just passes over our ears, like, oh, yeah, I know that. Okay, and let's move on. Because this is the greatest thing we could ever hear. It's huge. And it should never be diluted or, or done away with. All right? So here's a cool looking slide. I hope you can read it. I don't know if you guys got that good eyes, all right? But. This is the first, slot, first verse in our passage. It says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. So once again, we've got a black and white issue. We've got, there's two types of people, and that's it. Those who are perishing, all right, and those who are being saved. And am I saying that you're not going to get saved all the way before you die? No. I believe the moment you believe and you're born again, you are solid all the way through the end. But you're also going to get sanctified. So it is proper to say, I was saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. So there's either those that are on the saving side, and then there's those who are on the, the, the perishing side of foolishness. That's it. And really, what it matters to is which side of the cross are you on. That's what determines everything in life. Which side of the cross? Are you on the side of the cross that's doubting, that's mocking, that's scoffing? Or are you on the other side of the cross that's worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, that's believing, that's thankful, that's worshipful? That, those are the two sides of the cross. And we want to make sure that we're on that side of the cross that's believing. All right? It says in John 6, there's only one work that saves us. Jesus said there's only one work that is to believe. All right? Letters in red. All of the word of God is Jesus' words. Those are letters in red. In John chapter 6, he said, there's only one work you must do, and it's to believe in the Son of God. That's the only word. It says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever, I will set it aside. So here is Paul reaching into the Old Testament, into Isaiah 29, 14. That's why it's those capital letters. And he is using that as he teaches us today and as he taught the Corinthians back then. And that's always nice when you read your Bible to actually see, well, what kind of context was that Isaiah 29, 14 in? That context it was in was during the days of Hezekiah and, uh, and, the, uh, and this guy named Sennacherib, who was one evil man, had armies all around the Jews, okay? And they were worried, they were scared, and you know what God said? God said this to the prophet Isaiah, that he's going to destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever, he's going to set it aside. And you know what he does? He sends one angel that evening, and it kills 185,000 men of Sinatra. 185,000 men dead in one night. All right, now what kind of a human wisdom would you count on for that? What kind of a general would say, don't worry about it? We got the angel coming tonight. All right, they couldn't say that. They don't know that, but God did that. Okay, they looked like they were hopeless. They were few in number, and God sent an angel, one angel, wiped out 185,000 men in one evening. And that, once again, you can look in secular history. That is, uh, it's marked. It's, there was a great defeat for Sinatra. They leave out the part about the angel because they don't want to bring you toward God at all. But that is something that's been found in history. And I wrote, the cross crushes man's sin and man's pride. So like I said, it's an offensive message. Because none of us want to be crushed. We don't want to be crushed. We don't want to be put aside. We don't want to be lower than anything. And that is the message of the cross, is it crushes us. It leaves us that we absolutely have nothing and are nothing outside of Christ alone. It says, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So it's God that's making all this wisdom of the world look foolish. And yet, like I said, we are more educated than our ancestors are. We are not more moral. Okay, Man has not changed. If you read the Bible, you'll see yourself in its pages. And this is the oldest book known in the history of man, the Bible. They'll try to say, well... We have the uh, Code of Hammurabi, and maybe that's a little older. Maybe it is older than some things right there, okay? But truth was still truth. And if you notice the Code of Hammurabi, it's a little similar to our truth as well, all right? But they don't have any kind of work like the Bible. They have bits and pieces 
of little bits of things and then they try to say something big. We have a book that was written over 1,500 years worth of time with 40 different authors. Most of them didn't even know each other, just a few of them did. And they all coincide and it all connects. And it has withstood the test of time like no other book in the history of the human race. By far beyond. I tell you, it's, it's like thousands and thousands of copies we have that are 2,000 years old of this book. Anything else you have, you have like one copy to maybe 10 copies. And most of them are like way later type of copies, all right? They're not as far back as our copies are. We have God's Word. And it does make this, this wisdom of this world look foolish because it is foolish in comparison to Him. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So we're here back in Romans. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So this is what man has done. They took the truth of God and they gave it up for a lie. Just like Eve did in the garden. God told her all these things, told Adam these things. And then the devil said, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. And she ate the fruit. And I think, wow, and I wonder how many of us would have ate the fruit when we were back then too. Alright? But she exchanged the truth of God for a lie. It's the same thing every one of us does when we give up something that the Bible says and buy into something else that's different than the Bible. And it says they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Alright? So many people, they, they're all worshiping something. We are built by God to be worshipers. Every one of us is going to worship Him for an eternity in heaven and never stop worshiping Him. We are built to worship. But what happens is we're going to be corrupted if we're not following God and we're going to worship some sinful stuff. We're going to fall into idolatry and we're going to worship stuff or something else besides God if we're not worshiping Him. All right, And I wrote here too, a God discovered by human wisdom is a projection of fallenness. I think the best example of this is Greek mythology. When you look into Greek mythology and you study their gods, every one of them has messed up stuff. They all have some strong points and some weak points. And their weak points are usually in sin. And it's because, why? Because a fallen man who sins made himself a fallen, a God who's also fallen. And the God of the Bible has never sinned, has never done wrong, and is always in perfection. Every one of these false religions you'll read has a God that's doing all kinds of sinful stuff. One story about Allah in the Muslim religion is in the Quran. It says that there was a man who killed 99 men. And this man wanted to go to heaven. And he talked to Allah. And Allah said, well, if you can make it to this city and break the halfway point before you die, I'll let you into my kingdom. And the guy starts taking off to make it into the kingdom. And he doesn't make it before he dies. And the Muslims will try to say this is an act of grace. They'll say Allah shortened the distance between the cities. So he did make it. But really, that's no justice at all, because what about the poor 99 guys this guy killed? Where was the justice for those guys? Who paid the price for those guys? So here we see some sin. We see a partiality. We see, we see Allah making a good deal for this guy, but what about those 99 guys that were all killed, and where's the punishment going to be? In Christianity, everything is by justice. If you are a Christian today, Somebody paid for your price. And I'll tell you who somebody was, and I know most of you know it, is Jesus. Jesus paid the price for your wrongdoing on the cross in full. Mm -hmm. Somebody paid already for your injustice in fullness. This story about Allah, nobody paid for those 99 guys that were killed right there. He just took care of the one guy. And they'll try to do these things, and it's just a, a twistedness. And it's a projection of every one of these false religions. It's just a projection of a fallen man, and it has fallen traits within it. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased with the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So it made God happy to save people through a foolish message that a man could come and die that would be God on the cross and pay for your price, okay? And yet people reject God outright, all right? They, they hear the message and they don't want it because they say that's a foolish message. You're a crazy guy. You believe in fairy tales that you believe that all this is on the beyond and you believe in that book and that you try to stand by those standards of that book and that you believe there's an absolute standard and that there's only one way to heaven. They're like, that's crazy. 
You think about everything else. Well, it's true. You think about everything else, it's all going in the wrong way. It's a miracle that we have this book and that we have the knowledge of Jesus Christ that we can be saved and call upon him and believe him. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. All right. Now, if you were to be a Jewish person back in the day and you hear about Jesus being crucified on the cross, this would be the same as fried ice. Now, think about that, fried ice. <laughs> think about, could you make some fried ice today? <laughs> it wouldn't be ice anymore, would it? It would be boiling water or something, right? You can't make fried ice. But really, that's the same kind of stuff for these guys back then, the Jews, and maybe even the Gentiles here in this story, is it's like making fried ice. It doesn't make any sense. That doesn't line up. That's nothing that we've ever seen before. That's nothing that we could prove or that we can connect. It's the same as making fried ice, all right? And unfortunately, people are looking for God in the wrong place. They're looking for God through man's wisdom, through man's intelligence, through something some philosopher has thought about or said about, but the message that with Christ crucified is really the same as a fried ice type of message. It really does take faith to believe, and it goes beyond. And we're going to get to see a verse in Deuteronomy that, that, that the Jews had that said anyone who hangs on a cross is cursed by God. So back then, the, day, the talk would have been, what, you're a Christian? Don't you know this verse in Deuteronomy that says anybody that hung on a cross is cursed by God? Of course, that guy was cursed by God. He wasn't the Messiah, and that's what they would have held on to. They would have tried to twist God's word to make it fit what they wanted to fit to ultimately draw people away from God, to draw them where they were, away from God and lost from God. And I love this passage, and we're going to hit it again here, Christ crucified. That's what they preach. I had a sign a while ago out here, it's a pretty big sign, and I had it for our church that said, We preach Christ crucified. And that's why I hope every service I preach, I at least mention that. I connect you with that. I hope somebody, if they come here and they're lost, they hear that. Christ crucified. All right, that is a big deal. That is the center of the gospel that Jesus Christ was crucified for us. It says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples. This is back in the John. So we're talking about signs here, okay? Jesus performed many signs, which are not written in the book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Amen. the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So the Bible insists that we already have enough evidence. That we don't need a sign. We don't need a sign. All right. A lady told me this week. She's a wonderful lady. Don't make me out lady. But she told me she needs to go to a church where miracles are going on. It. She goes, I've got to go to a church where there's miracles. And she said, just knowing where I was too. I think. Yeah. And I thought, Listen, I no. And I thought of a church. This isn't the church she goes to, but there's a church in Middleburg Heights, Bethel Church. It has on the advertising of the sign. That says where the supernatural is natural every day. All right, so everybody's going to this church to see a show, to see some miracles going on. And you know what I bet? I bet you'd be hard pressed to see any real miracles going on there whatsoever. I bet you'd see a whole lot of emotionalism, a whole lot of people all jibber jabbering all over the place and jumping up and down and going crazy. But at the end of the day, what do they got? I hope they preach Christ crucified at least that people can come to Jesus and still be saved, but we don't need those signs. If we are only looking for a sign, then what have we got? If we are only going to church to see a sign, to, to, to feel a certain way, to get some way, then is it about Jesus Christ or is it back about man? Is it all about us or is it all about Jesus? If it's all about seeing a miracle, is that really about God or is it all about us? trying to get our faith to be more confirmed, or us to feel good, or for us to be able to talk about something. If we believe the Bible, there are so many miracles already written down and evidence in there, we don't need any more evidence like that. Praise God when miracles do happen. Sure, they still happen, all right? But they're not happening quite on the magnitude they did back then in the Word of God, all right? I, I just don't see it. I, I've yet to see all these kind of things go on as it did back then, and even back then. The entire Bible only has eight people raised from the dead. 
All right, if I Google on the internet, I bet you I can find 800 people supposedly raised from the dead from all these miraculous type things. And I'm like, hmm, all right, the Bible is only eight, but now there's like 800 of them in just a month or so or something, all right? So we have the evidence already, and, and we have it in the Word of God. It says, it says in Deuteronomy, what I told you, what the Jews would have said in the day, what they would have combated the Christians with is, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Because the people back then, after you got stoned, your body would be strung up on a tree for people to look at to see the shame of the sin that you did, so that maybe they wouldn't do that sin, but they wasn't even allowed to stay up there all night long. So when Jesus died on that cross, even though it's talking about a tree, is still being hanging up right there. They said that man is a curse of God. But if you look at what the big picture is right here, yes, Jesus was, had all of God's wrath upon him on that cross. He became a curse for us. He took the wrath of the Father God onto himself on our behalf for us. So this verse perfectly lines up with what happened in the gospel, what happened at the cross. But they didn't want to buy that version. They had their own twist to it, which would bring people farther away from God. And it didn't give them an excuse not to believe. It doesn't matter how much you try to twist things or change things. It doesn't give you an excuse. Because the Bible says we are without excuse. Nobody has an excuse. You can't say somebody just didn't know. Okay, The Bible is clear on that. And these guys knew their scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. But to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So this is like a hyperbole. If God could have any weakness at all, it's stronger than our strongest man. It's more smart than our smartest man on the face of the earth would be his weakest weakness. All right, This shows the picture of God it's trying to show hyperbole that God is so far up there, we can't even match up to anything compared to God. And people are always trying to remake God into their own image, which is a broken, fallen state. God is not broken and he has not fallen, nor has he ever been. Everything Jesus did, he did willingly. He did it because he loved us. It said on the cross, he said, he says that he could have called down legions of angels, like tons of angels. Think about that. One angel killed 185,000 people. And I'm sure that one angel is still in the Lord's army today. All right, because all we read about in the Bible was a separation where the, some angels fell, became demons, and some went on. And that was back in Genesis. We're talking about all the way over in Isaiah. So that one angel that's 185,000 men killer, there's probably more like it too. And he was still there. And he could have called, Jesus could have called on them. Everybody would have been done wiped out. But he didn't do it because he wanted to do the will of the Father. And the will of the Father was that Jesus would go to the cross and pay the price for us. Mm -hmm. All right? There's no weakness there whatsoever. That's strength. When you do something for somebody else, it usually takes strength to do that for somebody else. It's easier to do something for ourselves. When we do something for somebody else, that takes some more strength right there. And that was tremendous strength. All right, Jesus felt every bit of it. He felt all those sins. And think about when you read the Bible and how strong God's hatred is towards sin and how God would have people get stoned for collecting sticks on the Sabbath because of their sin and how bad he hated that stuff and then even more with all kinds of other sin. And yet he took that upon himself on the cross. It's tremendous. It says, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And that God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the things which are strong. So it's God's plan to use the foolish things. It wasn't God's plan that we all get super educated and only the elite can come in. In fact, we're going to see here in this next verse, he says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, okay, this is not the next verse, but it's coming here, but as an example is John the Baptist, think about this guy, what, he said he ate honey and locusts for a living, all right, had like a towel girded around himself. All right, and what does the Bible say about this guy? It says he's the smartest guy that ever lived on the earth. It says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. 
Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John the Baptist is considered to be the greatest man that ever lived on the face of the earth. And, he, and we have that joke about the guy that lives down by the river. All right, That's where he lived. He lived down by the river, baptizing people in the Jordan, and yelling at people to repent and believe. That's what he told me. He was baptizing in a baptism of repentance, living down by a river. And the Bible says this was the greatest man who ever lived on the face of the earth. John the Baptist. It also calls him the greatest prophet. Of all the prophets, John the Baptist of the Old Testament prophets. And so we got to realize that our picture, and I guarantee every one of you has pictures like I have, like you like somebody or you read somebody or something, like how great that guy is. They're not nearly as great as John the Baptist was, okay? We get the wrong perceptions of things when we start to look at this worldly wisdom rather than looking at the wisdom of the Bible. But going back to the verse here, it says, In the base things of this world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not so, that he may nullify the things that are. All right, so God chose the base things of the world. He chose the things that nobody else would necessarily choose. And he did these things to show everybody else, hey, your wisdom's all messed up. It's upside down. I remember when I took a psychology class, I was a young guy, I learned about uh, Maslow's hierarchy pyramid. And then as I studied theology, I realized it's upside down. All right, his highest point on his pyramid is uh, self-actualization, that you can get to realize who you are and really see the truth about who you are. In Christianity, you can't even be a Christian until you realize who you are, that you're a sinner, that you're lowly, that you're, that you're, that you're hopeless without God, and then it goes up from there. All right, so this world's philosophy and everything is completely upside down the way the Bible has the philosophy. It says, so that no man may boast before God. So none of us are going to be able to say, you know what, I did all these things, I went to all these schools, I did so much, and I did it all for God. You know, I, I did mission work, or I fed all these homeless folks, or I gave all this money. Nobody's going to be able to boast before God, because God took everything and turned it upside down. We can't do all those things. Only the cross of Christ can save us. And I wrote here, we are 100% saved by God, or we are not saved at all. If you're trusting in your salvation by anything other than what Jesus Christ did for you at the cross, you're wrong, and you're not even saved. You missed the mark completely. It's all what Jesus did at the cross. And here's a nice slide. It said, I wrote, what life is all about. It says, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So Jesus became all these things to us. Wisdom from God, sanctification, redemption, righteousness. All these things is what Jesus did to us. And I wish, I didn't make this side, I found a cool side, but I would have made that little N right before Christ Jesus a really big N. Because that's the N thing. Are we in Christ Jesus or are we outside Christ Jesus? If we're in Christ Jesus, we believe. That's what it's about. It's about believing. It says in 1 Corinthians again, it says, So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So if you're going to brag, brag about God. Don't brag about yourself. Bragging about yourself isn't going to do a whole lot for anybody. Okay? <coughs> Bragging about God is going to get somebody else to hear a message and see somebody who believes, which is an oddity today. And I'm sure it was an oddity back then too, to someone who really believes. And man, I wrote, man has nothing he has not received from God. Every single thing we have, it came from God. Our very lives, our breath, our skin, our nails, our hair, our eyes, our brains, everything we have, it came from God. Every tree, every substance we have to be able to make a building, to do whatever, it all came from God. So what do we have to boast for? We can't boast for anything. Even our salvation, completely from God. We didn't get it, we didn't earn it. God gave it to us as a free gift. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Well, indeed, Paul could have. He was a genius. He was like a PhD in the Old Testament. He probably was the smartest walking Old Testament Bible man in that day. You know, he was trained by the top guy of the day, Gamaliel, the rab rabbi of rabbis. He was a genius. And yet he says, I didn't come with all this smarts and everything like that to you. All right? He just came to you proclaiming the testimony of God. 
He said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's all I cared about. And I put, it's this our main focus. When we talk to folks and get to know people, it's our main focus hoping that we can talk to them about Jesus Christ and tell them how He was crucified for Him, that they might get saved. I tell you, I try to do this every day. Yesterday, I taught a class, had 10 folks here, and I talked a little bit about Jesus. I couldn't just start preaching because I'm teaching a class. It wasn't about God, it was just a regular class. But here, I was thinking in my mind, how can I connect with these guys? How could I meet with them later? How can I share with them the message of Christ? How can I get that there? All right, it, it's, it's my goal, it's my mission. I want to share with people Christ crucified. It may not happen immediately, because then there's this walk right away from me. I'm trying to look for effective times and things, but I am very intentional that I will do it. Okay? And it may take time, sometimes it doesn't, but I gotta be patient, I gotta I gotta do things the right way. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Alright? He had all kinds of issues going on, Paul did. Remember he was beaten, all kinds of he was in prison, horrible stuff happened to him. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So there wasn't any gimmicks or tricks or, or feathers falling from the ceiling or gold dust or, or smoke billowing out pretending to the Holy Spirit in the room or, or uh, buying people off or anything like that. He didn't have any gimmicks or any tricks or any persuasive words. He used the Bible, okay? Who's the Bible written by? It's written by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. It says in John 1, 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So every single word in the Bible is Jesus' words. And these are the words of wisdom that he used. Okay, He didn't use some man's, man's things to try to get somebody. It says, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Because if you get saved by some man, and then you see that man fall or fall into sin, or you realize he's not quite the man you thought he was, and your faith goes away and you quit going to church, that shows where was your faith to begin with. I, I read this thing that uh, one of these famous ministers in the past, a guy came up to him and talked to him. He said, you see that guy over there by the coffee machine? He said, yeah. And he goes, he's a disciple of mine. And the guy goes, like, oh, nice. He goes, no, no. You don't understand. He's not a disciple of Christ. He's a disciple of mine. And he's like, I've been trying to work on that guy for years. And all he does is look to me. He's not looking to Christ. And it was a sad story looking at that guy. That the guy was a disciple of his, but he wasn't a disciple of Christ. We all need to be disciples of Jesus. Jesus has got to be on the top of that mountain in our life. The top of everything in our life. Nobody else, okay? We may respect other folks, different things, but we got to realize nobody has that place in life but God that's above us. We're all on the same playing field, no matter who we are. Whether you're the PhD with 10 PhDs or whatever, or whether you're the homeless guy down there on the street, we're all on the same playing field when you look at the big picture right there. Amen. And Jesus Christ is above all and for all, and he's made it evident to all where it's clearly seen that they are without excuse to come to him. All right, so wisdom doesn't save, only God does. And I have one final question for you today. I usually put a bunch of questions. Today, just put one question here. All right, are you looking for a word from God to believe or a word from man to consider? And this is a question we've got to ask ourselves when we hear preaching. When you hear my preaching, when you hear preaching on the radio, are you looking to hear from God when you hear preaching and you look into the Bible? Or are you just looking at what's this guy got to say and I'll consider it? All right, we should all be focusing on what is God saying. Sure, some, we're all human beings. I probably say some things that aren't straight sometimes. I try my best to, but I'll make mistakes. Everybody will. But we shouldn't be looking to consider, what does that guy have to say? We should be looking, what does God have to say to me today? And when we do that, when we listen to preaching, when we go to church and different things, that's when real change can start to happen inside of our lives. Because it's coming from God and it's not coming from man. Because man's all messed up, all right? No matter how good the guy wants to be, even a Christian man, we still are tainted with sin. We need to be looking to God, to the Word of God, and looking to Him to believe. And I'll tell you as, you, as you grow and you believe, you'll just see more and more truth. Things will start to fall into place. Your belief will get more solid and solid. You'll be like that guy that asked Jesus to heal his daughter. And he says, if you just believe, all things can be, nothing's impossible. And he's like, Lord, help my unbelief. 
All right? And that's how we are. We're growing every day. Our faith is growing every day. But you know what? Our faith isn't what we need to get to some certain level. Because guess who grew our faith? Guess who put that mustard seed of faith within us? God put it within us. And when God starts something, He finishes it. It is in perfection because of Jesus Christ. It's not because of us. It's all because of Him. And the more we learn to lean on Jesus, trust in Jesus, and believe in Jesus, the more at peace we can be. All right, I, I, like I said, I'm working at this, uh, these uh, Alzheimer places and stuff, and I'm like, golly, man, some of these folks are in such rough condition, different things, their minds are going and stuff. But you know what I'm thinking is we're all headed toward that situation or that area of death. Every one of us is headed toward death. And thank God some of these guys love Jesus Christ. And you know what I was thinking too as I was singing songs this morning, one of the things that people that get to mention stuff, the last things they forget are their hymn songs. All right, And I, I felt a little ashamed because I can't just spit so many hymns just out like some of these older fellows can. Okay, I sat there and I sang with our hymn book with some of these older guys while we're sitting out there in the sun. And man, they were word for word and they weren't even able to read the page. I mean, they're having trouble reading. They can't read. But I'm sitting there reading it, and they're like not missing a beat and just going right on. And I'm like, Lord, I pray that if that happens to me, they say 60% of us that's going to happen to if we get 85. If that happens to me, may it be that I can still hold on to the truths of God, to prayer, to the Bible, to these hymn songs and different things, because they've come such a deep seated asset and part of my life that no matter how bad things get, I'm not going to lose Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful thing that is to be able to sit with somebody and sing songs that can't even hold a five second conversation with you because everything's messed up but yet you can sing a ten minute song. And one of those guys, you know what he said to me? He said to me on Friday as we were singing he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you need to take some singing lessons. <laughs> and I said to him, I said to him, well, I'm going to take one. I'm going to take one. He goes, you need more than one. That's, that's what he told me. And I thought, oh, you're right. You're right. That's what he told me. I thought, man, then I put on, I got some hymns on my phone. And I says, let me pray. I'll play. He goes, do you hear that guy? He can sing. And I'm like, praise God, he sure can. We'll listen to him sing. But this guy still had these things. And other times he's just not there at all. But all of a sudden it's like this moment of clarity. And he was singing with me. And I tell you, I think the only way that we're ever going to get to that point, if a, if a sad thing, a dementia or something ever hits us, is that we've let God to sit deeply within our souls and Amen. change our lives. It doesn't. It's not just a fluffy thing or a side thing, but it's something... Deep within us, it's our biggest, greatest deal is to know Christ more. To believe Christ crucified for us. And I guarantee you, I guarantee it, beyond the shadow of that, I lay my life on it, that everything in this Bible is true. And the moment that you die, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be with Him forever. And everything's going to be okay. All right, And it's a peace that all the writers of the Bible, what the God showed us in the Bible, King David saw in the Bible, that no matter how bad things got, they could hold on to that promise. And it was so valuable and so precious, and nobody could ever take it away from them because God's the one who gave it to them. Amen. All right? So I'm telling you today, I plead with you today, if you're not a believer, to believe. All right? And if you are a believer, keep letting this stuff sit deep within you. You know, And that's why I love those hymns so much. Because, yeah, they may not be the... The, the fancy, popular songs and the way things sound, but the words and the truth are so powerful. You can think about them and think, what does that mean? And you can hear the stories of God, and it just sits deep within you. And I don't want a hymn that just says like the same thing over and over and over again like the popular modern-day <laughs> Christian songs do. They only know one sentence. I want to know paragraphs. I want to know chapters of things. And I'm going to get that through learning these songs more and through knowing the Word more. We'll go ahead and we'll bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much today for each and every person that's here today, Lord. Thank you for, for, for bringing them here. Thank you for sustaining them. Thank you for the life that you've given them, Lord. Thank you so much for every believer here today, Lord, for that, for that seed of faith that you've planted within them that's growing and growing, Lord. Lord, I ask that you'd help us all to, to grow more in you, Lord. Help us not to hesitate. Help us not to contemplate man's wisdom and and let it, let, it, let it choke out your wisdom within us, Lord. Help us not to be like the seeds that were planted amongst thorns, 
and the thorns grew up and choked out the plants, Lord Jesus. But help us to be seeds planted on firm, solid ground of your truth in you, Lord Jesus, that we're going to grow, that no matter what comes our way, that nothing can stop us because our base foundation is in you, is in Christ crucified for us, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask you that you be with each person here this week, that you touch them, that you move in them, Lord, and that you be in the details of their lives, Lord. And Lord, if there be anybody here, Lord, that does not know you, I pray, Lord, that you would draw them to know you, that you put the seed of faith within them, and that you'd help them to see what is clearly seen in your evidence all around, so that they may become a believer as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Now you came and heard, before you go and serve, have a little fellowship. Talk to some folks you don't know. You see somebody you don't know. Make everybody feel welcome and love on each other. There's one thing for sure. We can talk all these things in the message of Christ, but if it's done without love, it's just like a clanging symbol, the Bible says, okay? So we've got to have love in everything we do. We can't just beat people up.